collaboration among five space agencies in 15 countries. The International Space Station is an unprecedented engineering achievement. It showcases the power of science to unite humans globally. The idea was once science fiction, but the space station changed all that. In 1998, we began construction on this platform for use by researchers, technology developers, educators, and more. It is now a world-class laboratory in the Earth orbit. still going getting stronger every day. So 20 years, what can I say about 20 years? Well, for almost every teenager alive today, for every moment of their life, there's been somebody on board the space station living and working. And I'll say a little more about shaping our future and what space does with shaping our future. I want to give you a personal story here because I brought up the fact about the teenagers, not just to talk about, you know, give you kind of an idea of how long that's been. But as a lot of y'all know, being a teenager is a time where it's really exciting and it's also really scary. And being the, being the uh, parent of a high school senior, I am equally terrified. <laughs> I, uh, you know, when my daughter was little, um, you know, at first I, what I was scared about was, would I give her the experiences that she needed so that she can make the decisions to shape her future to be happy? And of course, working at Johnson Space Center, working with NASA, I've had about 30 years of outstanding role models in all fields, engineering, astronauts, managers, technical people, female people of color. It's just, I mean, so many people to expose her to so that she can make up her mind on what she wanted to do with her life. So you can imagine how proud I was when at the age of seven, at a space shuttle launch, my daughter stands up and introduces our family and then tells the crowd that she is going to be the first person on Mars. <laughs> so of course I'm like going, oh, that's wonderful. My daughter wants to do this. It's just so exciting. But um, 10 years later, she's 17 now, she's waiting for all her applications, you know, her results for applications to come back from all of these schools. And I'm thinking, you know, first I was anxious about giving her good role models and helping her to shape her future and decide her future. Now her future consists of she wants to go to engineering school, she wants to work for NASA, and she wants to be an astronaut someday. So things haven't changed. You'd think I'd be excited, I'd be elated. I'm a little scared she's just doing what dad's doing, you know? So it, it makes me happy that she's excited about it, but I kept worrying about this. So. About a month or two ago, we're sitting at the kitchen table, and I look at her, and I go, you know, I'm really happy that you enjoy science. I'm happy you enjoy math. You're really good at it. I says, but you're also an outstanding singer. You're an excellent writer. I said, I don't want you to do something just because I did it. I mean, do you, is it possible maybe you'd be happier doing these other things? And I remember she looked at me because my daughter is not one to roll her eyes like a lot of teenagers are, but it was almost like going on behind the, you know, the screen. And she looked straight at me and she says, Dad, you do a bunch of really cool things. I want to do cool things too. So that was the end of that conversation. I, um, I gave up on that. I'm, I'm just, I'm happy for her. Uh, space is about shaping our future in general. That's just what happened with my family in one way. It has shaped the future of my family. Let me talk to you a little bit more about how it can shape your future and how it shapes the future of humanity as well. We know that many benefits uh, for people on Earth have come from our pursuit to explore space. It's yielded many, many byproducts. But the space station isn't just about exploration. It isn't about benefits associated with exploration. We're looking to go not just further to the depths of space, but also to use the environment to benefit life on Earth. Thousands of research investigations from well over 100 countries are represented by the research on space station. And over the past 20 years, R&D on the station has evolved to offer non-NASA researchers the chance 
to do research to benefit life on Earth. So this is your asset to utilize. As a taxpayer, you've already paid for the infrastructure and the flights. So we welcome you to join the hundreds of entrepreneurs, Fortune 500 companies, foundations, universities, and others that are taking advantage of the space station to accelerate your R&D objectives. We are living in a new era of space access. The things that we're talking about today may all seem very costly, but we've been working to establish new and affordable points of entry for you. Low Earth orbit is becoming democratized, with new turnkey services being rolled out every year that lower barriers to research for sponsors and for investors who are new to the space community. So the advantages of the space environment for R&D are more accessible than ever. Ultimately, what we're trying to say is that we're resetting expectations to let you know that it only takes you, your ideas, to get to the forefront of global leadership, to innovate, to inspire, to build an economy off the earth, and yes, to go farther into the unknown. So for your perspective, this is the actual size of the space station, the facility that can make your research a reality, your product marketable, or your business plan successful. So this is above an American football field. It gives you an idea of the full span of the space station. Um, it's a pretty big structure there. Uh, there's an Easter egg in this photo. Has anybody noticed it? Soccer ball. Who said that? Who said it? Did you get that? All right, hang on a second. Did you get the prize? <laughs> we reviewed this last week, and uh, it was, yeah, you're welcome. And it was suggested that I change this, and I thought it'd be better for audience engagement if we see if anyone saw it, because I literally dry ran this presentation a dozen times last week and missed it until I was presenting this, of course, in front of all my management. So that's the way it always works out, right? Hey, there's a soccer ball up there. I was like, where'd that come from? <laughs> all right. So this is your own over research team, our space station crew. They are the best and the brightest, and you're going to hear from one of them here soon. And they're dedicated to the success of your flight project. This is your flight project's ride to orbit via one of our commercial cargo resupply providers. They provide not only mass and volume allocations, but other services you may need, like power, thermal management, and we even have deploy capability for small sets off of our cargo resupply services. All that being said, We've certainly not forgotten about our adventurous spirit, the spirit we hope that you'll want to be part of. It's important for us to venture farther into space, maintaining global leadership in a space community that is rapidly pushing new boundaries. We are committed to landing again on the moon and continuing on to Mars, and the space station is a valuable asset toward those goals. Much of the R&D on space station has implication both for Earth-based applications and for furthering our exploration missions. So, you might ask, why do research on the space station? What does space-based research offer us? Does anyone remember the old real estate saying about the value of a, of a, a particular property? What's the three things that determine the value? Location, location, location. It's the, same, it's the same thing with the space station with regards to the unique environment and the things it can offer you. First one I'll talk about is microgravity because by, by far this is the one that a lot of folks in research like to take advantage of. Microgravity alters many observable phenomena within the life and the physical sciences. Eliminating the effects of gravity such as buoyancy driven convection for an extended period of time allows research to occur that is impossible in a uh, terrestrial or near terrestrial environment. Some research examples include flame propagation, the fundamentals of which can be understood better once gravity is removed from the equation. Protein crystals, which in space can be grown to a size and quality needed to understand the underlying biological processes. Biological cells in space aggregate into a 3D tissue-like architecture which better represents cell structure within a living organism. And fiber optic cables, which can be fabricated to a much higher quality due to reduced defects in the microgravity environment. This allows for a product that provides data transfer at a higher rate 
and or over a longer distance. The unique vantage point of the International Space Station is particularly useful for Earth and space science to include environmental monitoring, disaster response, heliophysics, and astrophysics. Based upon its location in low Earth orbit, observations can provide variable lighting conditions, and that's in contrast to remote sensing from sun-synchronous satellites like Landsat. And finally, the space station also provides a platform for extreme environmental conditions. These include temperature, vacuum, atomic oxygen, high energy radiation, and high speed micrometeoroid or little debris impacts. Testing and qualification of materials, sensors, and component subsystems exposed simultaneously to these conditions have provided data to enable the manufacturing of long life reliable components used on Earth as well as in some of the world's most sophisticated satellites and spacecraft systems. We learn new things every day to help us understand how to better live and work in space. And we need to keep learning to reach the lofty goals of the Artemis program and ultimately put the first humans on Mars. We hope you'll want to be part of this to further mankind through benefits here on Earth as well as enabling humanity's exploration of the cosmos. Space can empower your project like no other element can. At this point, would you please welcome to the stage Dr. Ryan Reeves from the ISS U.S. National Lab. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, so uh, I'm a material scientist at the uh, ISS National Lab. Um, and first, let me introduce what that means. So um, the International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory was designated by Congress in 2005 with the express, uh, the express purpose of providing access to the International Space Station and the unique uh, environment and platform, research platform that it is, to researchers like yourselves. Our organization took over in 2011 in terms of managing that national lab um, to identify opportunities uh, that, uh, for researchers like yourselves that ordinarily might not consider um, using the International Space Station as a research platform. We also uh, provide uh, the research, or I'm sorry, the return on investment of the U.S. taxpayer. Um, as David mentioned, the cost that we've already put into it, um, it represents a very significant uh, opportunity for, for research. So our ex uh, explicit purpose is to benefit life back here on Earth. Um, and so two examples of ways in which that this could be done, um, the first being that uh, if you remove uh, the, the dominant forces in gravity, and now you can start to look at some of the underlying uh, transport phenomena, you know, you remove buoyancy, you remove sedimentation, now you can start to look at other effects and you can start to, uh, you can really start to understand the fundamental properties of what are going on. Then you can use that information to better understand the manufacturing of life back here on Earth. In other examples, uh, you can produce materials, for example, uh, that are of higher quality than you can ever get here on Earth. Um, and so in those cases, you might be able to manufacture materials and, uh, and biological uh, pharmaceuticals in space uh, for uh, of a high, such a high quality that you would actually manufacture them in space and then bring them back down here on Earth. So our portfolio covers uh, a, a wide range of, uh, of different fields. Um, in physical sciences, so you can consider something as basic as boiling. Um, here on Earth, we understand that, right? But when you go into space, now that buoyancy-driven flow of the bubble removing from the surface isn't there. So how are you going to, how are you going to uh, transfer heat if you can't get the bubble to remove from the surface? Um, and so there are various strategies to do that, but um, all of this requires microgravity to do. Um, in Another example, one of the well-studied materials that has been done, NASA's done a lot of work in it, um, the National Lab, we've done a lot of work in it in terms of sponsoring researchers like yourselves, is in the area of, of semiconductors and specifically looking at the crystallization and the microstructure that you get when you remove things like sedimentation and when you remove things like buoyancy-driven flow. 
um, then you can really start to look at the dendritic growth, that microstructure, um, and, and how things are going to uh, crystallize and, and grow. In life sciences, there's been a lot of work in plant biology, um, but also in protein crystal growth and in terms of drug development, um, as well as 3D printing of human tissues. For technology development, uh, one thing that you might consider is that uh, there's the external exposure uh, platforms that we have, these well-developed facilities on the exterior of the, internal, uh, the International Space Station. And so you have a very uh, high radiation environment, and so maybe this can be a test bed for radiation-hardened electronics looking at things like memory or integrated circuits and how they behave in accelerated degradation testing environment like this. Uh, in addition, NASA has done a lot of work in the area of robotics and machine vision. Um, so I'm very excited about the ideation sessions to come after this and some of the ideas that, that we can develop uh, together with that. And when we talk about remote sensing, you've heard of the expression, the 30,000 foot view, right? Where you're looking down on it and you can get more perspective. Well, obviously now we're at a 250 mile view. And so now you can really start to look back down on the earth um, and see a lot of things. You know, you're, you can look at uh, uh, water use, agricultural land use, or you can start to look at things like methane emissions or uh, global sea temperatures, things like that, where now that provides a very good avenue for you to test your sensing applications on the International Space Station. So now um, let's go through some of the facilities and just kind of look around the International Space Station. Um, and in some cases, this won't look so different than what you might have in your own lab. So here we have the microgravity science glove box. Um, and so that we have glove boxes on station, furnaces, uh, microscopes, things like that. Um, and so in some cases, you'll be very familiar with the technology that's there. Um, but in other cases, you're going to need special challenge. You're going to have to overcome special challenges that the microgravity environment presents. Another example here is the uh, rodent habitat module. So. Um, here the crew is, is working with mice um, aboard the station. Uh, we've been studying mice for some time now to look at their muscle and uh, bone loss, um, as well as the effects of, of microgravity and radiation more generally upon living systems. Um, and so the crew can do dissections. We can measure the bone uh, density of the mice. Uh, we have um, DNA sequencers. So there are facilities on station that can accomplish a lot of the things that, that you might be familiar with. Um, centrifuges, cryostats, things like that. And of course, another asset that we'll have is the very talented, um, very educated, um, and, and smart crew that we have up there. But this is gonna be a limited resource. Um, so while they're going to be there to help set up the experiment and, uh, you know, at, at various times conduct some of the, the procedures that are necessary, uh, their, their time is a constrained resource. And so uh, a lot of the equipment has been automated such that um, we, can, uh, we can accomplish what we need to do without involving uh, that crew time. So let me talk uh, a little bit about some specific examples of things that are going on on station now. So Adidas is gonna be launching uh, in about a, a week or so. Uh, and what they are looking to do is to study the foam properties of the soles of their shoes. So they call that Boost, um, is, is the trade name that they use. Um, and so you can see they have, uh, have these shoes out there, the Boost in space. But what they're looking to do is as they form these, uh, these foam souls. Um, you can think about in gravity, you're going to have certain transport phenomena as well as sedimentation effects that are going to limit the geometry that you might get. Whereas if you do this in microgravity, there's the potential that you would have a more uniform geometry, that you could have more spherical uh, foams. Um, and so this can help you in two ways. The first is that you can learn things about that transport that can better uh, inform manufacturing here on Earth. But the other is that there's the potential that if things work out well and you get uh, some optimized geometry and you find out that the mechanical properties are really pretty good, 
Well, then you can use that as your gold standard. You can use that microstructure that you're seeing in there as the standard for which you want to optimize your manufacturing process to get to. Um, it can show you where your ceiling is of what you might be able to do. Another example is Goodyear. Uh, Goodyear flew last year. Um, and so what they were looking at is they used silica fillers in the rubber tires to improve the mechanical properties. Um, and specifically uh, in microgravity, what they were looking to do was better understand the, uh, the transport and the aggregation of those particles when you remove gravity as a sedimentation force. Uh, this next facility uh, just recently went up and, and had its, uh, its first uh, successful experiments, the biofabrication facility. So this is 3D printing of human tissues. Um, and so just recently they printed uh, uh, heart tissues. Um, so you can imagine when you're developing 3D printing on the ground, especially with things such as tissues, you're going to have to build up a scaffolding, right? And first you build up the scaffolding, then you build your layers around that until those tissues are strong enough to survive on their own. In microgravity, you can remove that scaffolding and you can just build the tissues themselves. And so now you're not going to get the deformation that you might get, and you can also make potentially more complex structures than, than is uh, possible here on Earth. So uh, David had mentioned um, protein crystal growth as a, um, a you know, as one of the advantages or one of the experiments that we conduct uh, on station. So the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, looked to study a protein for associated with Parkinson's to better understand that and look at drug development. Um, and so now in microgravity, you can then, you're not going to have the sedimentation and you can avoid a lot of the, um, uh, the material boundary interactions uh, by having that float around in the, in the container. Um, and so you can remove that and remove heterogeneous nucleation as, as an example um, and get higher quality crystals. Z-Blan. So Z-Blan is, is an exotic uh, optical fiber. Um, you can see up there it's, uh, it's metal fluoride. It's made up of five different metals. Um, but the interesting thing about it is, is that you can get orders of magnitude less losses, optical losses, with this material compared to silicon fibers. Now, the difficulty is, is that here, um, when synthesized terrestrially, you're going to get crystallization in there, and that's going to kill some of the properties of that. But NASA and some of the early work had shown that if you were to stretch these fibers and spin them in, in microgravity environment, you don't get the uh, you don't get the segregation of these part of, of the uh, different components. So something like barium and I'm sorry, something like aluminum and sodium are very light, but something like lanthanum is, and barium are going to be very heavy. Um, and so now you're when you stretch them and they kind of go into that plastic state, you're going to get segregation. Well, you won't have that driving force in gravity. And so there are three companies up there right now that are looking to manufacture these optical fibers in space. Um, and so they're proving out the business case that even with the, uh, even with the added cost of uh, space and the added difficulty that that entails, if you are able to make a product which is of such higher quality, um, you can, there is a business case for, uh, for producing things in space. Uh, and so the last example here is, is Budweiser. Um, so here they were looking at uh, germination of, of, of barley. Um, and so kind of what happens now when you don't have uh, gravity telling, uh, telling those plant seeds wears up and wears down. All right, so how do, you, how do you guys come in? Say you have an idea. Say you want to, uh, to get on the space station and you have, you have a, a research idea. Well, the simplest thing to do is we have solicitations out there right now. Uh, currently, we have two, one in the area of advanced materials and manufacturing, uh, one in the area of industrial biomedicine. Um, but even outside of those, we are taking uh, unsolicited proposals at all times. We put these out there to let people know, hey, uh, we're open for business and we, are, uh, we believe that there's really uh, a lot of research that can be done in these areas. But we're really interested in anything that can and does utilize the International Space Station as a unique uh, environment. So really the best thing to do is just to reach out and, and have a conversation with us. 
Uh, that can start with the ideation sessions later this afternoon, but um, they can continue on and that's, that's really the best way because each one of your experiments is going to be so, uh, so unique that it's really best just to have that dialogue and then we can talk about what can translate from the ground um, to the space station. So what we'll do is um, after, after a proposal is submitted and goes through review, um, you'd be uh, accepted. Um, and then you begin to work with uh, the various partners. Um, so here you would be working with um, potentially an implementation partner. This is a, uh, this is a commercial company. Uh, these companies have a lot of experience in translating ground-based research into space. Um, in, uh, in all cases, they, um, they are very well experienced in going through NASA's flight certification and safety uh, programs. Um, and in some cases, they will have uh, their own hardware that they will own and operate uh, on station. So then after that, that comes, then comes Ten, the fun part. Nine, nine eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Engines ignition, liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Cargo Dragon, transporting critical research to enable living and working in Earth orbit and in deep space. So that's SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket with the uh, Dragon uh, capsule on top, loaded up with your research. Um, that's, what's, that, that's what's inside. So you would deliver your payload and that goes onto the, uh, onto the capsule. Uh, <clears throat> the capsule will then dock with the International Space Station. Um, and so then this is your, what your research looks like when it's stowed um, aboard the uh, Dragon capsule. So then the crew will take out your samples. In some case, uh, the, those that require special stowage will be stored um, you know, here, in, for example, in the cryostat. Um, and then they will go and set up your experiments. Um, so they'll set them up, and a lot of times uh, they will do so with the help of your implementation partner and with uh, the potential for, for you to view as well, so that um, it's not just them doing it alone. They're very uh, smart individuals, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be an expert in everything that they do. They're going to have to cover everything from plant biology to, uh, to, to mice uh, to the material science. So um, they're going to depend a lot on the, uh, on the Johnson folks um, at NASA, as well as uh, the implementation partners as well, and yourselves to provide input to make sure that the science is, is correct. And so um, we bring it here just to kind of say that, again, a lot of this doesn't necessarily look so different than, than what you would do yourselves. Um, pipetting, for example, uh, you know, pipetting from, uh, um, from vials into a 96 well plate is something that happens in uh, almost all labs. Uh, the difference here being that you'll see kind of in the upper left-hand corner that they have to Velcro everything down because otherwise it's going to float away. Um, <clears throat> one other example, um, so in, we've done a lot of work and NASA's done a lot of work with uh, developing the capabilities and facilities on station. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that they're going to have everything that you're going to need. And so what some of the implementation partners have done is develop these cube labs. So you can consider these a black box that has data and power, and then you fill that with your experiment. So now um, you can control everything that's, that, that's in there, and a lot of times all of that would be automated um, so that the crew doesn't even necessarily need to do uh, a lot of operations with those. Then your, uh, once complete, your samples are returned on the, on the capsules. Um, and if you so choose, uh, those samples would be returned to you so that you can do a lot of the characterization here on Earth under your own uh, observation um, and, uh, and, and in your own procedures. But so that doesn't necessarily have to end your journey. Um, we also will then try to uh, we'll organize uh, various workshops and conferences so that you can share your experiences. Obviously, with a company like this, we understand and respect your intellectual property. It's your data. You're under no obligation to share that. But for those, especially going through the experience, it can be beneficial to, uh, to learn from and, uh, uh, and to use that information for the, for the next uh, 
uh, for the next experiment. So in addition to workshops, we have um, conferences. So this is a, a conference, the ISS Research and Development Conference that we co-sponsor with NASA. Uh, this year it'll be in Seattle in the first week of uh, August. Uh, but so in addition to that, we will have um, a publication, uh, quarterly publications that we put out um, so that we can spread the word of all of the great research that's being done. We'll put out white papers, reports, um, and, and publications uh, to try to spread the word of everything that's going on. And again, for us, it's all about benefiting life back here on Earth. So that's what our mission is, is to translate all of that back here um, to things that we can do. So with that, um, you know, we're really kind of here for you. We want to know, uh, is, is there a way in which we can use the great asset, the research platform that is the International Space Station, to further your research and development? So with that, um, I'd, like very, I'd very much like to thank you for your time, um, and, and I'm very excited to hear about potential ideas that you guys might have or how we can help you in your research and development needs. <music>